the Broadway Playhouse. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Broadway Playhouse, presenting the world's most famous stars. Now, here is our producer, Mr. William Keaton. In tonight's play, Edward, My Son, we have an excellent example of forceful drama. The tragic effect on an entire family when the father is determined his only son shall have the world with a fence around it. Metro Golden Mayor brought this gripping story to the screen. And as our stars tonight from the original cast, we present that beautiful and talented actress, Deborah Carr. And in another of his excellent characterizations, Walter Pigeon. Practically every business in the world that depends upon the goodwill of the people employs what is known as a public relations man. He's the fellow who explains how the business works, what it produces, and how it serves the public welfare. You of our armed forces are located in widespread locations throughout the world. You are there to preserve the peace that was won only after a long, hard war and to assist all the free countries of the world to maintain their rightful place in the community of nations. Part of the success of that job depends upon good public relations. Every service man and woman is a representative of the United States. You must be able to give truthful and complete answers to questions that will be asked. Only through this free exchange of ideas all over the world will mutual understanding become a reality. Remember, a country is known by its people. What people think about your country depends on you. Now, Edward, my son, starring Walter Pigeon as Arnold Bolt and Deborah Carr as Evelyn. <laughs> Some of you may have heard the name before. I own the Shelton Motor Company, a great national newspaper, and two or three biscuit companies. I don't tell you this to boast, merely to establish some sort of contact with you because I want your opinion. I want your answer to a question. Trouble is, of course, that none of you knew Edward. Edward was my son, my only son. He was 23 when he was killed, a lovely boy with a charming smile. I can remember when Edward was a baby. We were plain Mr. and Mrs. Bolt then, living in a little place in Hammersmith. Arnold. Oh, how wonderful, darling. It's just beautiful. Best baby carriage they had in the store. But of course. Oh, he love it, dear. And that isn't all I've been buying. Look. <gasps> Champagne. Uh -huh. Oh, Arnold, what a <laughs> birthday. Look, look what I've made for him. Oh, magnificent. I've never seen such a birthday cake. I wrote that myself on the icing. Happy birthday, Edward. Well, that seems to cover it. But don't you think happy birthday to Edward would have been better? Oh, no, no. This is perfect. Oh, and this is happy birthday to Mother from Edward. Oh, Arnold. A necklace. Mm -hmm. And real imitation pearls. Uh, However did you manage it? Someday you're going to have real, real pearls. Big ones. I? You believe in me, don't you? Why, yes, of course. Why do you ask? Because I've just gone into a new business. Oh, no. And I thought I'd like to do it on Edward's birthday. Might be lucky. Well, I've got to wash up. But, Arnold, what business? Uh, Americans call it installment buying. In instead of saving up to buy something, you buy it right away and pay for it gradually. Not so loud, dear. You wake Edward. Well, pay for what? Well, um, uh, furniture chiefly. Stoves, too, I think. Uh, maybe ice boxes. Well, it must be a very nice kind of business. You make people happy. That isn't quite why I'm going into it. Now, suppose we open that champagne. Oh, but Dr. Woodhope will be here any minute. I... Oh, dear, he's here now. Might be Harry. Harry? Harry Simpkins. Oh, darling, don't be silly. He's my partner in this new business. But he's been to prison. Well, he's out now. Harry was unlucky, that's all. I... I don't understand, Arnold. He's got some capital and a good business brain. It's the chance of a lifetime for me. He might trick you into something. Uh, don't you worry about that. Oh, I just don't want anything to be different, that's all. I'm so happy with things as they are. And I... Oh, 
Arnold, he's still waiting. Well, let him in. Oh, but what can I say to him? Uh, ask him how he liked being in prison, dear. Oh, coming. Just a minute, please. Oh. Wasn't I expected? Oh, yes, of course, Doctor Woodhope. I, I, I just thought... Oh, oh dear. <laughs> please come in, Doctor. Thank you. Uh, oh, um, this is for Edward. It, uh... It's a teddy bear. Oh, you are kind. He'll just adore it. Darling, do look what Dr. Woodhope brought. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. It's got Edward's ears, too, hasn't it? And look what I've got for him, Doctor. Champagne. Mm -hmm. Dear, dear. He can mix it with his milk, can't he? <laughs> That's a very interesting experiment, Mr. Bolt. Unfortunately, the young man's still sleeping. Don't be so sure, dear. Perhaps I'd better run in there and see. Excuse me, Doctor. Uh, Mrs. Bolt tells me Edward's doing very nicely. Oh, he's fine, fine. Do you think his eyes should be examined? Why? Is he finding it difficult to read? Oh, no, 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 seriously. I, I just thought you well, that you might want to check on them. Oh, you have a fine, healthy boy, Mr. Bolt. Don't worry about him. And it is a shame he can't come down and see his presence or hear the speech I'm about to make. Oh, dear, long one. Oh, don't worry, Mrs. Bolt. There's a doctor present. <laughs> we'll drink to Edward. Edward, my boy, you're sound asleep, I hope. You've kicked your covers off, I'm sure. I just tucked them back. This is just to let you know that we have the matter of your future well in hand. Sleep safe, Edward. The world shall be your oyster. Yeah, yeah. What does that mean, Arnold? The world his oyster? It means that nothing, nothing is going to be too good for him ever. Yes, that was 1919. Five years later, Evelyn and I were in the waiting room of the doctor's office. Some specialist would hope it sent us to. Edward was ill, seriously ill. And while we waited there, in agony, Wood Hope and the specialist were deciding the fate of our little boy. Boy six, you say. Only child, Wood Hope? Yes, Dr. Kettner. I attended Mrs. Bolt when he was born. I don't believe she can have another. Mm, it's too bad. Uh, the father, what are his circumstances? Oh, he has a furniture store. He hasn't been doing so well lately. Why? I was thinking of Schmidt in Switzerland. He does an operation with this condition, but uh, it's quite expensive and no guarantee. Mm, no, you better not mention it. Then, uh... Immobilize the leg in plaster of Paris for a year, and after that we'll see. Could I make it sound as hopeful as possible, Doctor? Of course, of course. Uh, I suppose you have them. Plenty. I... I don't mean to be rude, Dr. Kedner, but if you could... If you could just come to the point and tell me, tell us... Uh, well, Mr. Bolt, your son is suffering from what we call an atrophy of the nerves and the hip. Permanent? Oh, no, not necessarily at all. In a year, I'm sure we'll have him up and about again. He's to stay in bed? For the present, yes. And we'll put him in a plaster cast. But but after the year, he, he, he won't have a limp or... I have known of several most amazing recoveries, Mr. Bolt. Then he will limp. Now, you... Mustn't fret, Mrs. Bolt. That would be bad for the boy. Isn't there something we could do? Isn't there an an operation or a or, or electric treatment or, or something? Nothing that I can recommend, Mr. Bolt. Oh, we're we're very grateful, Doctor Kedner. I I know that Edward's in the very best hands. But if he needs anything, I, I I mean anything at all, we want him to have the best. Of course you do. But we must be patient. Yes. Goodbye, Doctor. Thank you. Not at all. Well, I suppose Kedner knows what he's talking about. The best in London, Arnold. Can you come home with me? I can't, darling. Harry's waiting for me at the shop. You take a taxi. Oh, there's one across the street. I'll get it for you. Larry, Edward won't get any worse, will he? You'll promise to tell me if he does. No, Evelyn. He won't get worse. But is there any reason for this? Anything I should have done... Anything I've done wrong? No, of course not. It could have happened to any child. But to Edward, my son, my only son, I, I can't just look at him and pretend. I can't. Yes, you can. I can't, I can't. Evelyn, please. I'll, I'll be all right. Yes, of course you'll be all right. The taxi's coming, dear. Uh, why don't you go with her, Larry? Well, would you mind if I went on the bus with you, Arnold? I've got a few things I... I'll be all right. Just try to come home soon, darling. Thank you, Larry. 
Why didn't you go with her? Because I didn't want to mention this in front of her. Arnold, how much money could you raise? Why, I couldn't raise... Why do you ask? Is there something we could do? It isn't always successful, but there's a surgeon in Switzerland now. Can you get hold of a thousand pounds? You mean Edward? You mean no limp? All I can say is that if Edward were my boy, that's what I'd do. If I could, that is. Um, that is, if it were possible. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, Arnold. I, I shouldn't have mentioned it. Now, look. Don't, don't say anything to Evelyn till it's all been arranged. Just go back in there and tell that doctor my son is going to have whatever is best for him. Go on. Go in and tell him that. Tell him he's going to have what's best for him. Then I came straight here to the shop, Harry. I've got bad news for you. I've got to get out of the firm. Huh? Yes. I'll surrender whatever interest I have for what I put in five years ago. Well, it's very nice of you, old man. I wouldn't do it if it weren't for Edward. He needs that operation, Harry, and I need 1,500 pounds. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, Arnold, but now I've got bad news for you. While you were gone, Baker paid us a visit. Baker? From the bank? They give us four weeks. I put all my money into this, everything I had. It wasn't enough. I'm so sorry. No. It wasn't your fault, Harry. But I've learned something now about bankruptcy. People who owe just a little go bankrupt. The little people. Next time I'll owe so much they won't dare let me go under. How do you know there'll be a next time? There'll always be a next time for me. Couldn't we sell out to some other firm? No, we could. Except our stock has never been paid for. I got a sort of prejudice about going to prison again. Supposing Edward were your son. Listen on it. I'd do anything within reason. Anything. But the sad truth is, we're broke. How much fire insurance do we carry, Harry? Three thousand. Are you crazy? I want no part of it. Just an idea. What makes you think you could get away with it? Get away with what? Oh, well, I'm glad you're not that crazy. This back premium's due. That's why I thought you might like to, well, put 200 more in the account. 200? For the back premiums. Then I could increase the insurance to 5,000, just in case something did happen around here. You said you only needed 1,500. Did I? You know... There's a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at its flood, leads on to fortune. Do you know who wrote that? No. Neither do I. But it wasn't a little man. And I'd be careful of that pipe. All this uh, stuff around here, why, it could go up just like that. Yes, you uh, be careful of that pipe. <laughs> Two weeks later, an early Sunday evening it was, I found Harry Simpkins waiting outside my house. Well, I'd have proud given you a partner. I'm glad I waited. I had to see you. Come on in, Harry. Where's the missus and the little boy? Don't worry. They can't hear you. Now, listen on it. I, I've been thinking things over. This fire insurance scheme of yours is off, see? It's off. Is it? I was crazy to agree to it. Come to think of it, I never did agree to it. Didn't you? Then why did you give me the money for the back premiums? Well, I want it back. And don't try to get smart with me, Arnold. You just give me back my money. Now. I didn't use your money for the premiums, Harry. Oh, you, you mean the scheme's off? Oh, why didn't you tell me? The scheme isn't off. I started the fire an hour ago. You what? I only needed a hundred for the premiums. The other hundred sent Evelyn and Edward to Switzerland. First class. I, I tell them the truth. That's what I'll do. Why not wait and see what happens? You'll sleep a lot better tonight if you do. Well, how, how will we be? How will we know when it happens? Well, I suppose we'll hear the fire engines. They go practically right by here, you know. Then I imagine the police will telephone me. Do you know how much we're insured for now exactly? You said five thousand. Six. I hope we haven't been too greedy. I think you've gone mad. So do I. Then why did you do it? I did it because I was pushed. And if it works out, I'll never complain about my luck in the future, no matter what happens. I'll gamble it all tonight gladly. I believe if you want anything enough, you can get it. And I want Edward to walk properly through life without a limp. That's all I ask, and nothing else matters in the slightest. And so it seems. Oh, come on, come on. I have a feeling this is my lucky night, and if you're... It's a bit too soon. Well, answer it. Answer it good next surprise. Well... 
Yes, this is Mr. Bolt. Say you'll come along right away. Yes, yes. What? Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, you fool! Is that how you think a man acts when the police that call That wasn't a telegram, Harry. That was a telegram, Harry, but it was from Switzerland. And listen, it started. They operated this morning. Successfully. Successfully. Do you realize what that means? My boy is going to be well. My boy won't live. It means that Edward... Come over to the window, Harry. Yes, there's quite a glow in the sky tonight. You are listening to the Broadway Playhouse. Act two will begin in just a moment. About 150 years ago, an Italian philosopher made the statement that the world is a beautiful book, but of little use to him who cannot read it. You of our armed forces can realize better than most people how true that statement is. You have the opportunity to meet new customs in old civilizations, to find increased enjoyment from the exchange of ideas with people of various countries. Many parts of the world that you had only heard about before are now open to you. It's a wonderful opportunity for you to help others understand a little more about the United States. There are many misconceptions throughout the world concerning our beliefs, our principles, and our way of life. You know the answers. You are first a citizen and second a serviceman. Help others to know us better. Help to make our part of the world an open book. Remember, a country is known by its people. What people think about your country depends on you. Here's our producer, Mr. Keeley. Act two of Edward, My Son, starring Deborah Carr as Evelyn and Walter Pigeon as Arnold Bolt. During those next few years following the fire, my luck was phenomenal. Everything I did brought success, money, and honors. I was Sir Arnold now, Sir Arnold Bolt. Edward, of course, was in school. And one day, in answer to a letter, I had an occasion to visit Mr. Hanray, the headmaster. No, not at all. I've been walking through the grounds. Beautiful, simply beautiful. You must be very attached to Granger, Mr. Hanray. I am indeed. I don't get to the country much anymore, so I must thank you for writing me. It was not a pleasant letter to write, Sir Arnold. We don't often admit failure here. That's where you differ from me. I never admit failure. Now, why do you want to expel my son? I'm not expelling him. I'm perfectly willing that Edward remain until the end of the term. I find it difficult to see the distinction. Sir Arnold, have you considered that this may be for the good of the boy? Believe me, I have Edward's interests at heart, as well as the schools. The schools? How? I find Edward a corrupting influence. I find the idea of my small son corrupting anyone rather absurd. If I didn't, I should be very angry. You don't like Edward, do you? Uh, my feelings have nothing to do with it. Well, mine have. I love him. Well, shall I ship him off to a reformatory? No, no, of course not. There are many excellent schools that specialize... I am not interested in excellent schools that specialize. I wish my son to remain here. I think that Edward is a normal, nice child and with a little understanding will be a credit to Granger. And where do you suppose he learned these things you complain about? From me? From his mother? He learned them here. It's your responsibility, and you're not going to shelve it. I can't accept that, Sir Arnold. Well, you're going to accept it, Mr. Henry. Are you threatening me? I am. Mr. Henry, there are certain mortgages outstanding on this school. Well? Those mortgages were in the hand of Dobson and Company. Well? Anyone holding the mortgages is in a position to foreclose, forcing yourself and the school into bankruptcy. I now hold them. You... I'd twirl my moustache, Mr. Henry, if I had a moustache. Yes, I acquired them when Edward entered here, just in case something like this should arise. Well, it has arisen, and I am now fighting with anything I can lay my hands on. I can't believe it. I'd be a hypocrite to say I'm sorry for you. I am prepared, however, to allow you to remain until the end of the term. I believe that's the prospect you uh, offered Edward. Well, well, I wonder what will happen to all these buildings, those playing fields out there. Hmm. 
factory-side, perhaps? One of those luxury hotels? And you... You really believe that what you're doing will benefit your son? I shall do my best to see that it does. I can't believe it. I can't believe that one man can destroy another man's career. A whole tradition. Nothing safe anymore. No standards, no principles, no... Good day, Mr. Henry. Sir Arnold, wait. Wait, please. Yes? I don't care about myself. I do about Green Grey. You win, Sir Arnold. Win? No. No, it isn't a question of winning or losing, Mr. Henry. Let's... Let's just say we've worked out a solution. And I suppose it is conceivable that we haven't done our utmost here to understand your son. Yes, yes, of course. Mr. Henry, I think it unwise that you should ever be placed in this position again. I am giving you this check, an unconditional gift to Grangery. I suggest you pay off the mortgages at once. But I couldn't suppose... It's in the interest of Grangery, and that's the one thing we both have at heart, isn't it? You... You're an astonishing man, Sir Arnold. Am I? I confess I've always felt skeptical about these Napoleons of finance who rise so mysteriously from obscurity. Mm, there's nothing really mysterious about business success. Indeed. Now, in my case, I had a small business and I wanted to enlarge it. What did you do, Sir Arnold? I set fire to it and collected the insurance. <laughs> Astonishing. Yes, isn't it? <laughs> I told you before I would give you the facts. The incident at Grangery School is one of the facts. It is for you to judge. By 1935, I was several times a millionaire, owning or controlling a dozen great companies. One afternoon, I promised to meet Evelyn at my office. Good afternoon, Miss Perrin. Oh, Lady Bolt. I'm sorry, Sir Arnold isn't back yet. I'm sure he won't be long. Dr. Woodhope's been waiting for him, too. Oh, really? He's in the outer office. May I send for tea? Oh, no, Miss Perrin. I'll just go in and chat with Dr. Woodhope. Evelyn, I'm so happy to see you, my dear. Oh, what a nice surprise. It seems like years, Larry. How smart you look. Oh, thank you. Edward and I are just leaving for Switzerland. Did Arnold send for you? Yes. I mean, as a doctor... I don't think so. I haven't been his doctor officially for some time. Anything wrong with him? Not that I know of. Larry, why don't you come to see us any more, unofficially? Well, I... I want to, Evelyn, but... Uh, you know how it is. You didn't come to Edward's last birthday. It was the first one you missed. Yes, I know. I... I just wondered if there was anything we'd said or done, that's all. No, of course not. How is Edward? Oh, he's very grown up now. He shaves every other day. Oh, the boy's a genius. Is he, Larry? Is he what? I don't know. A genius, maybe. Oh, Larry, I'm so glad to see you again. Tell me about Edward. Oh, well, of course, Arnold still spoils him dreadfully. I'm sometimes so afraid he'll never have any real sense of values... There are some things that are so wrong. For instance? Oh, I don't know. Well, for one thing, he's not quite as straight about money as he should be. And for another, Arnold lets him have a glass of port in the evenings, but he doesn't always stop at one glass. He's not 17 yet. Maybe he is a genius. Like Arnold? You don't like Arnold anymore, do you? Well, let's just say that I don't approve of some of the things he does. Lately? Well, the Simpkins bank collapse was a few years oh, ago. Oh, but that but... was Harry Simpkins, and he broke Arnold's heart when it happened. Only Arnold came out of it a much richer man, and Simpkins went to jail. Uh, didn't I read that he killed himself? Yes, it was terrible. Well, you don't know how Arnold tried to help that man. Do you know that some people believe that Simpkins deliberately set fire to their business that time? Then there are other people. Oh, that's horrible. Well, they're jealous of Arnold. Besides, anything he's done has been for me and Edward. I know. And he's made a most unholy mess of it. Tell me what to do, Larry. It's too late. But Edward's only 16. I'm talking about Arnold. Larry, you're our friend. You have the right to tell Arnold that loving Edward doesn't mean substituting money for... for... 
Well, you can tell him that you can kill something inside a person unless you treat him as a human being. That's all I ask for, Edward. And for yourself. I wasn't talking about myself. Yes, you were. Larry, that's wrong to say that. You've no right to... I have no right to love you either. I'd... I'd better be going. Edward will wonder what happened to me. You knew, didn't you? Yes. I've known for a long time. What ought I to do? You... you mean about... I mean about Edward. Hello, Larry. I'm sorry I'm late, Evelyn. Well, have you got everything, dear? Travelers' checks, cash? What about your luggage? Well, Mr. Groves is taking care of everything, Arnold, and when we get to Zurich, there will be a brass band and an illuminated address. Well, it could be arranged, you know. Arnold is to be made Lord Bolt next year, Larry. Oh? Oh, well, just a rumor, but I can't say I wouldn't be pleased to have a title to pass on to Edward... Larry, my boy, you should get married and have children. It's a great incentive. Well, I'm off. Goodbye, Larry. It has been nice seeing you again. Now, oh, what's all this formality between old friends? Goodbye, old friend. My best to Edward. I will. Goodbye, dear. Just have a good time, you hear, and get some of that color back. I'll wire as soon as we get there, Arnold. Yes, do that. She, uh, she doesn't look well, does she? Well, it's been so long since I've seen her... And uh, how do you think I look, Larry? Much as I expected, Arnold. Amazingly fit. Well, I am. I am. Uh, tell me, do you ever look at some of us ordinary human beings? Hmm? Uh, there are those of us who may crack under the strain of trying to keep up with you. Uh, those of us who are foolish enough or loyal enough to try. We should uh, talk about this, Larry. Someday when I have a little more time. I'm sorry. No, no, I, I mean it. Right now I want to talk about your hospital. I want to help you. I want to build a new wing. That's very kind of you, Arnold. Well, why not? After all, I'm, uh... Yes? The gentlemen from the Admiralty are here, Sir Arnold. Oh, they can wait, Miss Perrin. Admiral Benson is with them, sir. Oh, I see. I'll call you right back. Uh, sorry, Larry. There's a delegation of gold braid out there. Oh, that's quite all right. Look, I'll, uh, I'll phone you next week and we can have dinner, right? Yes, I'd be delighted, Arnold. Miss Perrin can always reach me at the hospital. <laughs> that's the trouble with you doctors. Busy, always busy. <laughs> Come in, Miss Perrin. What time is it? Almost half past five, sir. Well, anything left for me to do? There's a personal check if you care to sign it now. Mrs. Harry Simpkins. Oh, yes, of course. You uh, never knew Simpkins, did you? No, sir, Arnold. Poor chap, I really believe he blamed me for what happened to him. He came to see me one day after he got out of prison. I wanted to help him, set him up in business or something. Instead, he jumped off the roof of this building. It's very kind of you to... Help his widow. Maybe it's my conscience. What do you think, Miss Perrin? That's possible, I suppose. If there's nothing else, Sir Arnold... Sit down, uh, won't you? I feel like talking. What are your interests in life, Miss Perrin? Well, curiously enough, just at the moment there, Sir Arnold Bolt and company. Are they really? Yes, I... I like finding out about things, don't you? And uh, just what have you found out about me, for instance? Well, I've worked for you for some time, Sir Arnold, but I still regard all information concerning you as strictly confidential. That, that's very commendable. Uh, what do you do evenings, Miss Perrin? I go home. Do you really? <laughs> well, what did you suppose happened to me? Oh, I just thought perhaps you were... Oh, I don't know. You're, you're a very interesting girl, Miss Perrin. Would you like to have dinner with me tonight? As a reward for my diligence, Sir Arnold? Oh, no, 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 just because I'd like to. Do you mind if I go home and dress? As a matter of fact, we'll both dress. Pick you up at 8. 8.30. What, uh, what's that? Uh, what are you writing down? Just my address, Sir Arnold. That's how it started. Eileen Perrin and I, a love story, sordid, discreditable. But I want you to know about it, not because I fancy myself as a middle-aged Don Juan, but because it is part of the whole story. Many months later, Eileen discovered that her apartment was being watched by a private detective. At the time, Evelyn and Edward were in Paris. 
Two days later, I joined her there. I'm sorry you didn't let me know you were coming, Arnold. Edward and I are leaving Paris today. Are you, Evelyn? In half an hour. That is, if I can find Edward. What does that mean? It means that I've been checking all the cocktail bars, but I can't find him. So you're leaving. And where were you going to hide from me? Why should I hide from you? On the advice of your lawyer, I imagine. Anyway, I can tell you where Edward is. I phoned him this morning. Did you? I told him I wanted to surprise you. We thought the best way to keep you here was for him to disappear for a little while. I told him I didn't think you'd be angry. I am angry, but not with him. Like all your actions nowadays, I find it very underhand. And I find it underhand to have one's husband investigated by private detectives. Incidentally, Evelyn, I haven't the slightest intention of giving you a divorce. I'm delighted to hear you say so. Really? Why? Because I should like you to fight and lose. I want Edward to realize that with all your money and power, there are still some things you can't get away with. I've seen Eileen Perrin for the last time. You can believe that. What did you tell her, Arnold? Was there a scene? Did she cry? You're not an unattractive man, you Stop know. Stop it. I won't listen to this sort of... I beg your pardon. Anyway, I want Edward to see the sort of man his father is. I think he knows that by now. No, no, he doesn't. He admires you, Arnold, as I used to. He loves you, as I used to. I think a divorce is the only way of bringing Edward to his senses. Why? What's he done now? Edward got very drunk last night. Oh. He's 17, Arnold. If he goes on like this, what will he be like at 20? All young men get tipsy now and then. What's so terrible about that? That you don't think it's terrible. That's what's so terrible. To you, it's all rather a joke, isn't it? When I ask you to stop sending him money, you promise me, and then you break your promise. I'm frightened, Arnold. I'm frightened for my son. That's why I'm taking him away. Where? Oh, anywhere, away from England, where he can learn what it is to work for his living and to have responsibilities. I shall be one of those because I don't intend to take much money with me. Do you think Edward's going to agree to all this? Oh, poor Edward will be quite a shock. But I think he still loves me. And he's not altogether lacking in courage or pride. Arnold, I, I'm awfully tired. Do you mind going now? Go where? I'm still your husband. We're not divorced yet, you know. How long did you tell Edward to stay away? Oh, just long enough for us to have a little chat. Well, we've had it. Please leave. Don't be silly, Evelyn. I'm not trying to excuse Miss Perrin, but I didn't realize that it had made you so bitter. I'm sorry. You haven't understood one word of what I've been saying, have you? Only that you think the only way to deal with Edward is to break up his home. Home? When did he ever have a home? Something that wasn't a cross between a toy department and the Bank of England, presided over by a perpetual fairy godfather who granted his every wish before he even thought of it himself. There are women who'd be grateful to a man who did just that. Possibly, but I'm not one of them. I've seen the fairy godfather when he's off duty, and I think it's time Edward should, too. So you're going to tell him everything? Arnold, let go. You're hurting me. You're going to tell Edward everything? Yes, yes, everything. I assume that means Larry, too, of course. Larry? Larry Woodhope's in love with you, and I think you're in love with him. That's why you want the divorce. You must be mad. This is going to be very bad for him, Evelyn. The Medical Association has very narrow ideas about doctors who make love to their patients. Are you accusing me of... No, not yet. But you should know what private detectives can do once they get started. And I'll make very certain Larry gets his full share of publicity. I don't think I've ever despised you as much as I do now. I've always fought for Edward, and I always will. And if you think you can slander me, turn him against me, you've made the biggest mistake of your life. Edward is my son. Yes, Arnold. I'm afraid he is. Please... Will you go now? Not until you promise to drop this case. Why should I? Because I've made the stakes too high. You never were much of a gambler, were you? Hello? Yes, just a moment. The uh, desk clerk wants to know if you're staying tonight or not. You are staying, aren't you, my dear? I won't, I tell you. I won't, I won't. Hello? Yes, we're, we're all staying. Send up my baggage, please. <laughs> Hey, 
In a moment, we'll return with Act Three of Edward, My Son. Tonight, I'd like to introduce the popular Hollywood commentator whose radio personality is known from coast to coast, Miss Frances Scully. What's your scoop tonight, Frances? Well, Bill, I can't wait to tell your audience about that mighty musical of the Mississippi, Metro Goldwyn Mayer's new Technicolor production of the immortal love story, Showboat. Mm, a star-studded cast including Catherine Grayson, Ava Gardner, Howard Keel, and Joey Brown. And I know that Catherine Grayson, as Magnolia, realized a lifelong dream, the opportunity to sing the famous song hits of Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein. And Ava Gardner's voice matches her beauty in the haunting delivery of her songs. <laughs> oh, it's a musical feast. Howard Keel singing the role of the romantic river gambler, Gaylord Ravenel. And Joey Brown is perfect, playing beloved Captain Andy. <laughs> Producer Arthur Freed and director George Sidney are famous for their musical productions. And the picture has everything. A dramatic love story, beautiful girls, magnificent music. Showboat is glorious entertainment. <laughs> Curtain rises on Act Three of Edward, My Son, starring Walter Pigeon as Arnold Bolt and Deborah Carr as Evelyn. <laughs> I fought my wife for my son and my home, and I won. Again, those are the facts. Whether or not I deserve to win is something for you to decide. It's 1939 now, with the war starting to close in around us. I had no idea you were calling. I've been waiting for your husband, Evelyn. Since he fixed the time himself, I thought for once he might be punctual. Oh, he treats you disgracefully. My dear, this is Phyllis Maiden, Dr. Woodhope. How, How do, do you do? do? Our Dr. Woodhope, Phyllis, who brought Edward into the world. Oh, then I must thank you, Doctor. Here's a secret for you, Larry. Phyllis is my daughter-in-law-to-be. Well, how wonderful for you, Miss Maiden. I hope you and Edward will be very happy. Thank you. Yes, they will be, I know. Very happy. I simply must run, Lady Evelyn. I'll never be at the Barclay by 8.30. Oh, we're having a little party, Larry. Will you join us? Oh, please do. I'm sorry. I'm rather busy these days, you know. Oh, I'm sorry, too. Goodbye, darling. And do tell Edward not to keep us waiting. Yes, yes, I'll tell him to hurry, dear. What do you think of her? Very lovely. How's Edward? Well, perhaps marriage is what he needs. Well, that's rather a drastic reform, isn't it? We'll have a drink to celebrate. How do you think I'm looking, Larry? Fine. Fine. When I get Edward married, maybe I'll try taking a cure. Do you think people know I drink? No, I don't. Arnold does. Perhaps that's why he sent for you. Perhaps he thinks you... Larry! Well, as usual, my apologies. That's all right, Arnold. Did you bring Edward back with you? Yes, he went upstairs to dress. Evelyn, you haven't forgotten the party tonight. No, Arnold, but I I think I'm going to have one of my headaches. Just I... run up and change, dear. You'll be late. Didn't you hear me? I said I was going to have a headache. You're not going to have a headache, Evelyn. You're not going to spoil Edward's party. You see, Larry? No headache. Isn't it marvelous? You and Edward go ahead. I'll join you there later. Well, I suppose we can talk here, Larry. I'll uh, close the door. Well, what's wrong, Arnold? Where does it hurt? None of your little doctor jokes. I feel fine. I asked you here because I want you to meet someone, a girl. Miss Maiden, I've already met her. Congratulations. Thanks, but she's not the girl I'm talking about. You see, Edward's already married. Who's joking now? Nobody. It happened ten days ago. Edward's been in Sussex, been doing a lot of flying lately. Anyway... Some of the pilots staged a party. When Edward woke up, he discovered he was married. Well, the girl was no stranger, I suppose, but believe me, he had no intention What to... about Evelyn? Does she know? Oh, no, of course not. No one knows. I'm uh, having the marriage annulled. There'll be no publicity. And the bride from Sussex agrees to all this? I think she will. Yes, 
Young lady to see you, my lord. Oh, yes, I'm expecting her. Have her come in, please. Does Edward know she's here? Oh, yes, he gave us carte blanche to handle the whole deal. Well, that was very considerate of Edward. I wanted a witness, Larry, if you don't mind. You're a doctor and an old friend. Well, at least I'm a doctor. Miss Foxley, my lord. Miss Foxley, I'm Lord Bolt. Oh, how do you do? And this is Dr. Woodhope, old friend of the family. He brought uh, Edward into the world. Yes, I'll never live that down. How do you do? You were very nice to come here. Please, sit down. I've always wanted to meet Edward's father. I have seen your pictures, of course. I wish we had met under happier circumstances. Well, I suppose we may just as well get down to business. You don't mind Dr. Woodhope being here? Oh, no. No, I don't mind. How long have you known Edward, Miss Foxley? Oh, n nearly a year. You knew who he was, of course. Well, not at first I didn't, my lord. And you, uh, you think he's in love with you? Well, Edward's a funny boy, you know. I think he's a bit afraid of responsibility. It's made him stop loving me for a while. But, well, we are married, and... And, uh, and what? I don't know. But I feel sure everything's going to be all right. It's not that he's weak. It's just that he thinks I... Well, that, that I made him marry me. And suppose that I think so, too? Edward deeply regrets having married you. He wants it annulled. Yes, I know. He sent me a letter. Oh, but he must tell me so to my face. It's no good his running away like this. Well, the thing we have to think about now is, what are you going to do? I don't know, my lord. Miss Foxley, will you be guided by me in this? Uh, do you have a family? No, no one. I'd like to be your friend if you'll allow me. Thank you, Lord Bolt. Now, I'm not for a moment condoning Edward's conduct. I think he behaved very badly, but... Uh, oh, uh, uh, Larry, I, I think Betty and I can work this out between ourselves after all. Oh, that's all right, Arnold. I'm quite interested in your plans. Yes, I know, but it is rather... Uh, rather family matter. And oh, I... I don't mind him being here, my lord. Really, I must insist. I'll leave on one condition, that Miss Foxley gives me a promise. Now, if Lord Bolt suggests something that you don't agree with, you'll walk out of here. Oh, now, really, after all, go on, get out of here, will you? When I have had a promise. Then promise, Miss Foxley, please, let's get something settled tonight. I promise, Dr. Woodhope. Satisfied? No, I'm not satisfied, but I'll go. And if I can be of any help, I'm in the phone book, Miss Foxley. Lawrence Woodhope. Well, now we can get on with it. He's a nice fellow, but he's a bit of an old woman. And I'm a fool, aren't I, Lord Bolt? Nonsense. You're a young and pretty girl. And one day you're going to make the proper marriage. But I'm not such a fool as to think I could ever fight for Edward against you. Besides, if Edward really loved me... I want to take care of you. I don't need anyone to take care of me. Edward's the one who needs that. But what are you going to do? Nothing that need cause you any worry, Lord Bolt. Nor even any money. If Edward wants the annulment, he can have it. It was that simple. Edward and Phyllis Maiden were married the following spring. It wasn't the elaborate wedding I had planned. It took place during an air raid. Edward in the uniform of an RAF pilot. Three months later, Edward was dead. Hello, Larry. In at the birth, in at the death, my friend. I've been away. I've only just heard. I'm having a little celebration. Will you have a glass of wine, Larry? It's his birthday, remember? Of course. Thank you. Edward... My son. Do you remember his first birthday party? And Arnold's toast. The world's your oyster. Very well. I often think of that day. It all seemed such a perfect start. And yet, it was only the beginning of the end. Oh, I'm a maudlin, drunken old woman, Larry. Why do you waste your time? Evelyn. It all went wrong, Larry. And I don't know why. That's what I want to know, why. It wasn't that Edward was weak and that Arnold spoiled him. Other people spoil their children and they get over it. Why couldn't Edward? Edward would have got over it. He would have been all right. Arnold's gone down to the airdrome. He ought to be back soon. 
he'll welcome someone to talk to. I shall go quietly up to my room and drink myself to sleep. I keep a bottle there, just quietly by myself. Isn't it extraordinary what people do? Oh, no, please. Are you still in love with me, Larry Woodhope? Would you like to... No. The trouble with drink is that it makes you just a little bit uncouth. It's no use my asking Summers for any more because he won't let me have it. It's rationed, you know, by my husband. Larry? Oh, here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Lord Bolt. Larry, nice of you to come. I've been away, Arnold. I didn't know. I've just been down to uh, see Edward's commanding officer. You should have heard what he said about Edward. Just about the best pilot in the squadron, that's what he said. Didn't know what fear was, a born leader of men. What an extraordinary life that man must have. Sitting around there all day telling parents fairy stories about their dead sons. Edward was killed stunting his plane. Don't you think you'd better go to bed? No, Arnold, I want to find out about Edward. I never really knew Edward properly, not like his commanding officer. He summed him up in 30 seconds. Just as long as it takes a sparrow to fall to the ground. They said it would take Edward about 30 seconds to fall. He wasn't very high. I wonder what he thought about. What his commanding officer would say, I suppose. A born leader of men, just like his father. <laughs> I thought that would please you, Arnold. He didn't say where you thought of leading them, did he? He didn't know the real joke, did he? He didn't know that the leader himself had lost all sense of direction. Evelyn, please, let me help you. No, no. Well, just to the staircase, perhaps. It's amazing. I can never find that staircase. Ah, here it is. Do you know how many steps there are, Larry? I do. I've counted them. You see, sometimes one can't see quite as clearly as one would wish, and then it's a great help to count. One, two, three, four. Goodbye, Larry. Five. She says things she doesn't mean, Larry. You mustn't blame her. I don't blame her. Oh, I suppose Edward might have been a different boy if I'd been another sort of man. But I wouldn't change his memory by a hair's breadth. You think I spoiled him, don't you? No, no, perhaps... I did what I thought was best for my son because I loved him. You can't do any more than that, can you? Can you? Can you? Evelyn died in April 1945. A few weeks later, I went to Harley Street. I, I wanted to see Larry. His office was crowded, but being an old friend, I walked right in. Come in, Arnold. Come in. Nice of you to see me, Larry. There's such a mob out there. Well, I always have time to see Arnold Bolt, apparently. I've... Never been here before, have I? Good heavens, Larry, all these baby pictures. You've got quite a family for a bachelor. What can I do for you, Arnold? You can sit down and talk to me, that's what you can do. Larry, huh? who's that little baby on the wall? What a bright little face. Boy or girl? Uh, boy. You remember all of them, I suppose? Mm, most. Incredible. To think that you and I ever looked like this. Whose child is this? Her mother and father called Grosvenor, I believe. Oh, cute. Which one is Edward's? What? Which one is my grandchild? I don't think I know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do, Larry. At 2 p.m. on November the 3rd, 1939, according to my report, a seven-pound son was delivered of Betty Foxley. Delivered, I might add, by Dr. Lawrence Woodhope. Go on. That's all my investigators have been able to discover. For the moment, that is. 
Which one is he, Larry? Which one is Edward's son? You'd like to go through it all again, wouldn't you? Making the same mistakes with your grandson that you made with Edward. Well, I'm not telling you a thing. You may as well. You know, I'll find out sooner or later. But I'm planning a little trip to America, and I'd like to take the boy with me. It'll do him good. I thought you might be getting tired of England by now. Now, why do you say that, Larry? Oh, rumors. You and the bank inspectors. Larry, where is my grandchild? I know you're lonely, Arnold, and I'm sorry for you. But no. Betty's married again. Happily married. You'll never find her. You're a fool, Larry. But I don't need your help. I could use it, but I don't need it. Everybody in this crazy country is turning against me these days, but I'll beat all of you. You, the bank inspectors, anyone who gets in my way. I always have and I always will. These baby pictures. <laughs> it's ridiculous. They're all beginning to look like me. Well, ladies and gentlemen, something went wrong. Just a little wrong. They sent me to prison. Prison, mind you, for burning down a furniture store back in 1924. But that's all behind me now, that I can get on with the search for my grandson. He'd be 12 now, 12 years old. Well, that's the whole story. What I did and why I did it. What's your answer? If you had been me, what would you have done? Oh, well... Good night. Here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. And we invite them forward for congratulations on two excellent performances, Walter Pigeon and Deborah Carr. Walter, we want you to know it was certainly worth changing our rehearsal schedule so that you could be here. Can you take time now, Walter, to tell us about your trip to Philadelphia last week? Well, I left last Thursday morning to attend the annual music festival at Robin Hood Dell, which is a treat for any music lover. And I returned, well, as you know, just about in time for the show. Well, it was pretty close figuring. And uh, how about you, Deborah? Have you given up your expensive traveling since making pictures in Africa and Rome? Yes, Bill. <laughs> I decided I have enough material for a book, an autobiography of an actress's adventures in Africa. <laughs> that may start a new trend in books, but with actors going all over the world these days to make pictures. But how about your trip to Rome, Deborah, and the many weeks you spent there making Quo Vadis for metro golden Mayor? Well, I think I'll leave that task for my co-star, Robert Taylor. I don't think I could do justice to it. You, you just have to see Quo Vadis to realize what a gigantic undertaking it was to recreate those early days of Christianity and the Roman Empire. Well, it's just too spectacular for me to put into words. Well, I can assure you that I won't miss it. metro golden Mayor has a really outstanding schedule of pictures this year, Bill. You won't want to miss Ezio Pinza's screen debut with Janet Lee in Strictly Dishonorable. Yes, and now that you two have returned to Hollywood, I hope you're going to settle down to more picture-making and stay a while. I hope so, too, Bill. Believe me, traveling abroad makes you appreciate the comforts of home. <laughs> Good night. Good night and bon voyage to Bill. You have just heard another adaptation of a successful screen drama with some of the world's most famous stars from... The Broadway Playhouse. This is Tom McKee inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another great play from The Broadway Playhouse. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.